Thank you very much, Paul. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, and I am speaking to you today in my capacity as President of In Vivo Planetary Health and also Director of Origins, as you've heard. Uh, all of the author proceeds from my trade paperbacks are donated to research. Um, I also want to mention that I am an artist and I believe that art and science are part of a, the same story. So I, you will see that I, I use my art in uh, illustrating uh, many of the concepts um, that I'll be talking to, about today. I'm really going to be reinforcing the message that uh, we need to take ecological approaches to, to health. Um, because human health cannot be separated from the health of our environment, the physical, emotional, social, economic and political environments. And so the modern health crisis is really inextricably linked to the erosion of all of these interdependent uh, ecosystems and we must take multilateral approaches to solutions. Understanding the biology of complexity is fundamental to this, and that requires the recognition of the interdependence and interconnectivity of all systems, and not looking, losing sight of the big picture as we dive into detail. And I really want to focus on the importance of understanding the totality of the environment across lifetimes and across generations, the complex interplay between our physical, emotional, social, political, environmental and economic, and even spiritual dimensions of health. Because we really need to understand the interplay between the factors which promote health and those that undermine health. And we can think of probiotic and probios uh, in this much broader term. And of course, dysbiosis is anything that undermines that. Health on our planet depends on minimizing adversity, understanding the complexity and multidimensional uh, dimensions uh, of uh, dysbiosis or adversity and how we may promote the value of protective factors uh, in the environment, the buffering factors, which we often neglect in these conversations, the importance of nature, the importance of biodiversity, as John's already stressed, traditional foods, community, and positive emotions, which all have so-called probiotic uh, effects. And so we really need to, to promote concepts that personal and planetary health and the environment are all intimate, intimately interconnected. Promote these concepts of high level wellness, not only when individuals reach their full potential, but when the interests of individual societies and the environment are fully aligned. And that is something we need to aspire to in our world today. And this is very much under the auspices of, of the Lancet Commission's uh, uh, proposal around planetary health, which really requires that we look at the totality of health on this planet, person, place and planet under this banner, and really uh, emphasise these integrated ecological solutions uh, to health. There is no health without ecological health, and that all thriving uh, ecosystems depend on diversity, interdependence, uh, and balance. And of course, humans have played a major role in disrupting uh, that balance on all, in all systems and on all scales. We know that the health of every ecosystem depends on the health of its smallest parts. And of course, when that applies uh, to uh, uh, microbes, if we, we can see them very much as the foundation of all ecosystems. They're essential to the biodiversity on, on this planet. And that is equally true of the complex, diverse, personal ecosystems that we all carry. And the health of those ecosystems, our own ecosystems, depends on the health of the environment around us, but also our relationship with the environment around us. And both of those things have been eroded in terms of the environment around us, but also we are becoming increasingly disconnected from natural environments. So if we look at the microbiome in this context, we can see that it provides a very nice story. It's a direct line between our personal ecosystems and the uh, uh, wider ecosystems around us. In other words, that line between personal and planetary health. And we can see that dysbiotic diseases, as we call them, uh, are really a human barometer of what is really going wrong on a global scale. We are all trying to exist 
in the Anthropocene. This is an era of profound ecological balance and that's reflected in all biological, social, economic and political systems uh, and again at all scales. So very much now we can see there is a direct line between uh, uh, dysbiosis, if we define that in its broadest terms, as a life in distress uh, at the cellular level, but also at the planetary scale. And we can see the drivers of dysbiosis, which I have depicted in the middle there, are the factors which are driving the global burden uh, of dysbiosis, but also that cellular burden of disease. We are particularly concerned about the increasing uh, unhealthy uh, food systems. We are seeing an increasing poverty in the quality of our food. And this is driving dysbiosis both, again, at the personal scale, but the global burden of these systems. And there we're seeing increasing reports and increasing um, concerns about the inextricable link between human health and environmental sustainability. Ironically though, in an era of excess, it's the facets of loss which are also eroding our health. And that extends from the tangible physical losses we've talked about, the biodiversity loss, species loss, loss of local foods, right through to the loss of community, loss of language, traditions and stories, to the even less tangible losses of value systems, privacy, solitude, peace, purpose, respect, compassion, and the awe and wonder which are all vitally important for both physical uh, and uh, societal uh, health. So in many ways we are dealing with a dual burden and we've labelled this concept as dysbiotic drift. Uh, the increasing burden uh, of losing the burden of absence of the protective factors in our environment added to the increasing burden of the detrimental exposures, uh, of course, all adding to this dysbiotic drift. And of course, commercial forces and the absence of policy are driving dysbiosis uh, at all scales by default. Of course, as we've already heard, uh, decades of macro scale biodiversity loss are reflected at the micro scale in terms of micro scale ecological loss. And there are now increasing studies showing uh, that there are disappearing microbes uh, in westernized population, populations. And this, of course, uh, as we've heard from John, has direct implications for physical, mental well being. Many of these effects are mediated through the immune system. And dysbiotic drift, therefore, is one of the major factors implicated in the modern health crisis, this overwhelming increase in the burden of non-communicable diseases, which extends from the physical right through to the mental uh, conditions. And of course, uh, this uh, has its grounding uh, in early life, because we know that the ecology of the early environment is really what determines our lifelong health and that extends from microbial diversity, nutrition, nature, right through to social interactions during critical stages, uh, stages of development, which all impact on our immunity and impl have implications for all aspects of our health. I'm an immunologist and of course the immune system is such a central part of this story uh, because it is core to all aspects of physical and mental health. We can think of it as an intelligent interface between uh, the, in, the uh, uh, internal environment and the external environment. So that everything uh, that we are in, uh, exposed to is influencing the immune system and immune system in turn is influencing the development and function of all systems. And of course, we've, we know this is highly dependent on the uh, diversity of early microbial exposure. Inflammation, of course, is now recognised as one of the most significant uh, uh, and important threats to human health. It's a common antecedent and propagator of virtually all non-communicable diseases. And we now know that all of these conditions are now associated but with uh, altered microbial signatures. Whether that is cause, whether that is effect, we certainly know that by mod modifying the microbiome in animal models, we can modulate disease risk. Um, so 
we can certainly see that there is immune dysregulation and dysbiosis associated with all of these conditions. So I prefer to describe them as diseases of dysbiosis. And as I've indicated, a significant component of the risk of all of these conditions is programmed very early in life uh, and is associated with immune dysregulation. And we see this reflected in the unprecedented increase in early onset non-communicable diseases and all of these conditions, whether we're talking about allergic diseases, autoimmunity, right through to uh, metabolic conditions, but also child mental ill health, are all associated with inflammation, immune dysregulation, and increasingly uh, dysbiosis in the microbial sense of the word. So we're beginning to see that non-communicable diseases are actually transmissible through social vectors of dysbiosis uh, and economic systems, and of course the intergenerational effects. Technology culture is something we really need to include in this conversation because this is now a dominant driver of dysbiosis. It's promoting nature deficit, it's also promoting many of the unhealthy behaviours which are, are implicated in disease. And concerning uh, uh, new studies suggesting that this is implicated in this new teen crisis of disease, the teen mental health crisis, but also an increase uh, in anticipated physical uh, disorders. And even more so, we're seeing a rising in bullying and narcissism, a decline in empathy, and also concern for the environment, which also has inter, uh, indirect effects for the future implication for the caretakers of our future. Screen time is implicated in numerous risk factors for non-communicable diseases and there are growing concerns, particularly paediatricians, around in preschool children. Uh, the interaction even between mother and child is being interrupted with screen time. But we can see that many of the risk factors for NCDs, stress, eating behaviours, food choices, nature deficit, all of these factors linked to microbial dysbiosis and inflammation. Diet, of course, is a critical part of this story. We know that diet is one of the major determinants of our changing microbiome. And you've already heard this from John, so I'm not going to talk about this in detail. But we can see that modern diets, especially ultra-processed foods, are major drivers of dysbiosis and NCDs. Probably even more important than the cleaner environment and antibiotics in some ways. Diet changes the microbiome and the metabolome within days. Of course, uh, the diet is a major substrate for our bacteria. Uh, and those uh, microbial products, the short-chain fatty acids, such as acetate, butyrate, propionate, are the factors which mediate many of the anti-inflammatory effects of uh, bacteria. These, of course, have local anti-inflammatory effects in the gut, but they also enter the systemic uh, uh, circulation to influence metabolism, mood, behaviour and appetite. And this occurs even in pregnancy, where we're now seeing increasing evidence that short-chain fatty acids crossing the placenta have epigenetic effects and uh, other effects on the developing fetus, uh, including uh, now promising studies in animal models showing allergy preventive effects of short chain fatty acids in pregnancy and we are currently undertaking uh, prebiotic uh, studies in pregnancy to look at this in humans. But changing our food is one of the quickest ways that we can change our gut bacteria, uh, therefore changing our genes, in other words the hollow genome, recognising that 99% of our genes are really microbial and our metab metabolism and we can achieve this relatively quickly. It's important though that we, when we think about food, we think about food just, justice at the planetary scale as well. And you've probably all seen uh, the work around eat, the Lancet EAT study, studying food in the Anthropocene and the growing imperative for sustainable diets, which are not just healthy for people, but they're also healthy for, for place and planet as well.
The bottom line is it's all connected. The health of the environment is echoed through on every level. Planetary health is personal, from the planetary to the cellular scale, including the epigenetic effects that our environment is having on our DNA that is having transgenerational consequences and implications uh, across uh, the line. So it's very important that no matter what we're doing, whatever our field of interest is, that we take an integrated systems approach to the exposome and not just focus on the middle of the circle here, which is what we're apt to do at meetings like this. It's time to really break down the silos and, dice and re return some of the life and vitality that has been systematically dissected out of health and science. This concept, this systems-based, organs-based um, approach, if you like, has just not kept pace with our understanding uh, of the dynamic e ecosystems uh, within our bodies. But the microbiome sciences have really helped change this world view, starting to see the bon body as a dynamic and responsive ecosystem, an integrated hollow biont containing uh, hollow genes, as I've said, uh, and really much more dynamic um, and much uh, more pliable than we might have ever believed. And this is actually uh, really encouraging how we may be able to modulate the inflammasome, the metabolome, and the microbiome for much more ecological approaches to health. It means we must move beyond blaming individuals and recognise that dysbiotic diseases are really a human barometer for what's going on on a global scale. And these challenges cannot be separated from the broken dysbiotic systems which are damaging human health, the social fabric and the natural environment. As I said, we are living in a, a, an era of profound ecological imbalance and that also applies to our social ecosystems. Uh, when eight men, and eight, they are men, own more wealth than 50% of the global population, there is an enormous ecological imbalance. And in biological terms, that would be viewed uh, as cancerous. We need to recognise that social injustice is ecological injustice. That when we are talking about adversity in the total uh, exposome, that is really amplifying dysbiosis. That social disadvantage magnifies, ma magnifies the stresses uh, and deprives people of the buffering factors. I don't have time to talk about it, but if you're very interested in a true story of ecological injustice, uh, do take a look at our, um, our uh, paper that we wrote uh, on uh, this uh, astro food, where there was direct marketing to disadvantaged populations claiming uh, nutritional equivalency. Even mere feelings of social inequality amplify dysbiotic behaviours and unhealthy lifestyle choices, and we really need to be aware of this. Sto social status signals influence the mindset of children, and experimental studies have really shown, even transiently, if you amplify feelings of social in uh, uh, inequality or powerlessness experimentally, it increases your appetite and desire for high energy energy foods. So we really need to be thinking about the signals we're sending our children. The point that I'm really trying to make is that exposome science, if we really are moving into an era of personalised medicine, it has to address these contextual complexities, the biopsychosocial ecology of the total lived experience and understand that Health cannot be addressed or achieved without also addressing inequality, injustice and the, the wider drivers of dysbiotic environments. Everything is pointing to the importance of reconnection with nature, restoring and preserving ecosystems, rebuilding communities, urban habitats and microbiome, rewilding through local foods, green spaces, community cohesion, social equity uh, and health benefits and the health benefits that follow from all of these things. And it's really important that we invest in grass, grassroots strategies in communities that restore both personal and planetary health. 
Uh, we need to create much more ecological sustainable uh, solutions. We're seeing many uh, solutions to environmental um, challenges using probiotic approaches, which I don't have time to talk about. All sorts of exciting probiotic solutions to, to um, benefit our food systems, to improve, improve soil ecosystems, crop yields, insect and animal health. Uh, so one of the lovely examples from my network that I love to talk about is the bee colony restoration because that's so vital for our food systems. Uh, our colleagues are giving probiotic biscuits to bees to improve their immune function and resilience to pesticides. So a lovely example of simple systems that may have far-reaching effects. And of course, we can talk about probiotic supplements uh, for human health. And we're seeing increasing evidence around the benefits in, in uh, allergy, metabolism, gastrointestinal, even mood disorders. But all of these will be of limited value unless we also promote probiotic mindsets, the social and uh, environmental concerns, the positive attitudes to healthy and aging that have to be uh, in tandem with this. I can't underscore enough that mindsets matter for both our personal health, uh, but also planetary ecology. There are now decades of research showing how our mindset will influence our personal stress, inflammation and ageing, and we now need to promote planetary mindsets that promote values, behaviours uh, that are in line with planetary health. And this is important because attitudes and mindsets develop very early in childhood. Attitudes to the environment, attitudes to food, health, ageing. Uh, and this should have a much greater emphasis uh, in our health promotion and disease prevention strategies. And this is really the basis of the Origins project that I, I run in Perth. It's a local project with a global vision. Uh, its overarching aim is a healthy start for a better future. Uh, it's a large community-based cohort of 10,000 families with both uh, observational domains but also nested harmonised uh, interventions. In broad terms, we're looking at interventions which minimise adversity and negative exposures, restoring positive and protective factors, but building a community around it which really facilitates this. Um, and we want to, uh, the sort of buffering and, and protective factors we want to promote are things around biodiversity, healthy food choices, healthy microbiomes, mindfulness, optimism, and we hope that some of these upstream stream approaches to wellness behaviour will have flow on downstream effects to the usual risk factors that people study. Of course, we will also be addressing those usual risk factors as well. I just want to give you an example of a simple uh, exper experiential intervention that we will be using uh, uh, in collaboration with our colleagues in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, remember, young children really um, have even seen dirt, let alone played outdoors. Uh, they did, in a pilot study, this wonderful 10-week program where they had outdoor play, nature discovery, short-term environmental discussions uh, at, uh, pitched at ch children and also their families, and lots of activities playing with food and vegetables. And after that 10-week period, the children were more connected with nature, they were more concerned about nature, recycling and concepts like that. They were much more active, they had improved improved eating behaviours, improved quality of life and physical functioning. And more importantly, or as importantly, it also influenced their parents' behaviour as well. Uh, and of course, we will also be studying the effects on their microbiomes. But we really hope that community projects everywhere will be part of the solutions, not just in each community, but through shared stories and co-creation with communities, this will become part of a global uh, network uh, to improve planetary health. Uh, it's driven by the community in consultation with the community. Young families are really a wonderful opportunity, a unique window uh, into a period of life when families are very motivated. And also, their families, just from participating, feel, feel a greater sense of cohesion, belonging, and purpose. 
So as I said, we hope this will be part of this local, uh, uh, we start locally but expands our planetary, on a planetary scale as part of the grassroots uh, initiative, uh, hoping to contribute to new normative value systems. We want to create hope, creativity and purpose, these positive emotional assets which are greatly neglected on the global health agenda. These are vital for human health uh, and we really need to think much more like nature if we hope to tra make transition from the Anthropocene to a new era of mutualism uh, which some have labelled as the Symbiocene. But the big question is whether we can evolve beyond our self-destructive behaviour that is destructive to our social fabric. And to take the words of Jonah Salk, it really is time for a new step in human evolution. Our survival really does depend on this. And I take this quote from uh, Gus Speth, Yale professor, US advisor on climate change. I think it says much. I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystems collapse and climate change and that good science could address these. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy and to deal with those we need a cultural and a spiritual transformation. And I, I really think that this is really about getting to the roots of the problem where change begins. Uh, and for all of us, whether we are concerned about a health problem or an environmental challenge, we're usually pretty good at the symptoms, understanding the disease, the processes and the pathways, the causes and the risk factors, and our public health colleagues are very good at understanding the causes of the causes. But we rarely, if ever, get down to the deep roots uh, and the purpose that, that really cause these problems, the, that shape our cultural identity and the, the spiritual belief systems that have become eroded and devalued in modern society. And that is where we need to change the story. Our future depends on pro-health, pro-social, pro-environmental values and behaviours, especially in our children, if we hope to shift the trajectory of our future as individuals, as communities, and at the planetary scale. It really is, as Jonas Salk suggested, about the evolution through ideas. We know that biological ev evolution depends on genes to change their characteristics and behaviour, and that takes millennia. But an idea can rapidly transform the nature, characteristics, and behaviours of individuals and society. So I want to stress to you the power of an idea, of ideas to change our behaviour and our biology. And if we are to undo dysbiosis on this planet, no idea is too big and no conversation is beyond us. The best way we can nourish the next generation is with simple and empowering concepts of connectivity, hope and possibility and of course, kindness. The next generation are our greatest responsibility, but they are all our greatest, also our greatest hope. So for all of us at every age, um, I leave you with this thought, whether we're talking about person, place or planet, it is best to act early, but it is never too late. So with that, I would like to thank you all uh, and invite you to uh, in vivo planetary health if you would like to, to be a member. Uh, our next meeting is in Amsterdam uh, next year. Thank you very much.